Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your people. Thank you for all the believers. And thank you for everyone gathered together with us. We're asking, Lord, that your spirit will reveal your might to everyone in Jesus' name. And what you reveal by your spirit, we will respond to positively by the power of the spirit in Jesus' name. Teach us your way. Show us the path. Lead us in the path of righteousness. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. Once again, I want you to remember that we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we've studied already from verse 1 through to verse 24. I want to see by the grace of God to complete the chapter today. But I want to remind you of the very important verses that on which we anchor everything we're learning. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 looking at verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. That verse seems to say it all. Avoid fornication. Avoid sinning. Avoid defilement. Avoid ungodliness. Pursue holiness and pursue godliness. And in pursuing holiness, you're pursuing heaven. As a result of that, on the side, on the area of marriage, let every man every man without exception every man at all times every man in every generation every man in any church every man at a marriageable age let every man without exception have his own wife and let every woman every woman every virgin everyone every sister without exception have her own husband with that foundational pivotal verse whatever else we read we must come back to this and understand this is the standard of the word of god look at verse 39 in verse 39 it tells us now as the apostle brings the whole chapter to conclusion the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives he comes to the conclusion and he says whatever you don't understand whatever you understand whatever you hear other people say as to the interpretation of any verse of the of the chapter you have read here is the final scene the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives but if her husband be dead she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the lord underline that only in the lord that is as you get married you are staying together you are joined together you are glued together and nothing must bring you asunder or, or make you separate until the husband dies until the wife dies then you'll be free to marry at the end of such a union but if you're going to marry remember a believer will marry a believer the brother is in the lord he'll marry a sister in the law 
the sister is in the Lord, he'll marry a brother in the Lord. Only in the Lord. Let's come to verse 32. In verse 32, it tells us, it says, But I would have you without carefulness. Yes, we get married, but you'll not be with worry and anxiety. If you are single, no carefulness, no anxiety, no dissipation, and no worry. It says, I would have you without carefulness. If you are not married, if you are married, whatever stage you find yourself, no anxiety and no worry and no, uh, no distraction. It says, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord. How he may please the Lord. It says, the center of your life, the focus of your life, the purpose of your life, the pursuit of your life is that you see how to please the Lord in whatever stage you are. Verse 35. In verse 35, it says, this I speak for your own profit. It says all that we're learning on the basis of the marriage of the believer and the believers who are married, they are staying together and those who are not married yet, they are committed to the Lord, they are consecrated to the Lord, they belong to the Lord and they serve the Lord without carefulness, without anxiety and without worry, all that I say for your own profit. Number one, your personal profit. Number two, your spiritual profit. And number three, your earthly profit all the time you'll be here on earth that you'll concentrate on the Lord and you are worshiping the Lord without distraction. Number four, eternal profit. I'm saying all this, I'm teaching you all this and the application of what you learn should be for your eternal profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely for that which is proper and for that which will help you in your personal life and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So everything you learn, all the verses you read, they are based on this, that you will attend to the Lord. You'll attend to the work of God. You'll attend to the calling of God. You'll attend to obedience to the Lord without distraction. Today, we're looking at submission to God's unchanging word. Submission to God's unchangeable word. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, in number one, the solemn consideration of the present distress. At is, at is happening today, pandemic, distress, disease, and suffering, and pressure, and restriction, everything, it happened at that time. There was distress. It was a present distress of them. It was a local distress with them. And it was a temporary distress. And yet Paul the Apostle had to consider that the solemn consideration of the present distress. Number two, the single-minded consecration without perplexing distractions. It says whatever is happening, be not perplexed. Whatever, maybe the sea is running, maybe there are rumors of war, and maybe there is pandemic, and maybe there are challenges and difficulties, local and global. You will not allow that to perplex your mind, single-minded consecration without perplexing distractions. Number three, the selfless confirmation of his perfect doctrine. He has declared his mind. He has revealed his will. He has said the word from the very foundation of the earth. He has said that word of marriage. And when Christ came, he confirmed that. And now you as a believer, you want to be selfless as you confirm the doctrine and the teaching of Christ, which is perfect. Whatever you are going through, you will not use your situation. You will not use your predicament. 
you will not use your peculiarity to misinterpret the word of God. You'll be selfless as to confirm the perfect doctrine declaration of Christ. Let's come to number one. Number one is the solemn consideration of the present distress. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 25. Now, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. In verse 26, it tells us, I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. It says, I know what your Corinthians are going through. I know what the world is going through. I know the present distress. And because of that present distress, I consider this and I look into this. I've not really got any revelation from the Lord concerning this. But all the same, I give my counsel. We're looking at three things here. Number one, the apostles' concern for the present distress. The apostles' concern for the present distress. Number two, the appropriate counsel in line with the prevailing declaration. The appropriate counsel and his prevailing declaration what has god said that must prevail what has christ said that must prevail what do we read in other epistles even written by paul the apostle that must prevail the appropriate counsel and his prevailing declaration number three the appreciated concentration on our preferred destiny well when we leave this world we'll go to either to the right or to the left on the right you have heaven you have glory you have the habitation of God. You have the good place where you enjoy forever and ever. On the left hand side is the destiny of those who have not lived according to the word of God. They were not saved or they were saved, they, they backslid and they backslid and remained in that backsliding position until then. There is a destiny for them too on the left hand side there's sorrow there, there's sadness there, and there are, there's weeping there, there is gnashing of teeth there, it's a heavy punishment, a fiery punishment, a, a damn, damnation that is going to be forever and ever, and you make your choice, you have your preference. And if heaven is your preference, if heaven is your preferred destiny, then the appreciated concentration is that you concentrate on what will get you to heaven, not on temporary relief or temporary enjoyment. Let's come to number one. The apostles concern for the present distress. We have read that already. It said in verse 25, in verse 25 it says now concerning virgins I have no commandment of the Lord yet I give my judgment I give my advice I give my counsel as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful in verse 26 it tells us I suppose therefore now you understand the language of scripture when Paul the Apostle talks about faith in Christ, he doesn't say, I suppose, therefore, when he talks about holiness without which no man shall save the Lord, he doesn't say, I suppose, therefore, when he talks about the very fact that it's only by grace we are saved through faith, he doesn't say, I suppose, therefore, but because he has not got anything from the Lord no revelation on what he was going to say from the Lord that's why he said I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress 
after this present distress forget all about this for the present distress after this a uh, kind of pressure a kind of peculiar difficulty forget all this and make sure that you are still working and you are living on the permanent revealed standard of the word of god the apostles concern for the present distress now understand whenever a prophet says anything you know, that is not anchored on the solid unchanging unchangeable word of god if that prophet if that apostle if that servant of god listens to the lord the lord will bring that person back to where the word of god stands in second samuel chapter 7 we're looking at verse 3 second samuel chapter 7 reading from verse 3 and nathan said to the king go do all that is in thine heart for the lord is with thee he had not heard from the lord he had not received any revelation and what david said he was going to do building a sanctuary for the lord it appears good for the present situation we don't have any sanctuary and you wanted to build the sanctuary go ahead do all that is in thine heart look at verse 4 in verse 4 and it came to pass that night that the word of the lord came unto nathan saying verse 5 go and tell my servant david does thus says the lord now there is a revelation now there is a declaration and all those personal idea personal opinion for the present situation for the need we have go and do what you have in mind all that will have to be pushed aside go and tell david my servant thus says the lord shall thou build me an house for me to dwell in and then god told him not to do it we're looking at first samuel chapter 16 reading from verse 6 first samuel chapter 16 reading from verse 6 and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said surely the lord's anointed is before me looking at the situation and looking at all the children of jesse and this one that has come if it's uh, the position of a king if he's the personality of a king if he's the stature of a king and he said surely the lord's anointed is before me but he had not heard from the lord and he gave his own idea and he gave his own opinion and god said uh, in verse 7 but the lord said unto samuel look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because i have refused him for the lord sees not as man sees in the day in the night the lord sees not as man sees at the time of the present distress and the present destruction and the present predicament and the peculiar pandemic that the world is going through even at that time the lord sees not as man sees for man looketh on the outward appearance man looketh on the outward circumstances but the lord looketh on the heart so whatever present distress we might be in we still have to go back to god if we don't have a revelation the lord has not spoken to me about that yet go your way when the lord speaks to me i will give you the appropriate answer we we'll come to number two there number two there is the appropriate counsel and is prevailing declaration the appropriate counsel that must be in line with the prevailing declaration we're coming to first corinthians chapter 7 verse 27 and thou bound unto a wife seek not to be loosed 
you are joined to a wife you are joined to a husband seek not don't find excuse to be separated and don't find excuse to be divorced and don't find excuse to be loose then i don't lose from a wife seek not a wife the second part is seen look at the present distress look at the trouble on earth and look at the perplexities we're all facing and so if your husband is dead and you are loosed from the husband by death or maybe the husband is separated and gone why don't you just live like that again the prevailing declaration of the word must stand seek not a wife look at verse 28 in verse 28 but and if thou marry thou hast not seen you understand paul the apostle is saying because of the present circumstances maybe you should remain like that but please understand if thou marry that is you are single or your husband is dead or your wife is dead if thou marry thou hast not seen and if a virgin marry she has not seen nevertheless such shall have trouble in the flesh but i spare you what it means is that there are some pains there are some diseases there are some things that are peculiar to marriage women and it says that there, there could be disease and there could be this challenge and that challenge there could be a body which he refers to a trouble in the flesh it says but i spare you do the will of god now the appropriate counsel and his prevailing declaration exodus chapter 18 reading from verse 19 exodus chapter 18 reading from verse 19 here is counsel after giving the counsel you'll understand how the father-in-law to moses also said please go back to god i gave my idea i gave my opinion i gave what i think is the best but please go back to god it says in verse 19 i came now to my voice and i will give thee counsel and god shall be with thee be thou for the people to god watch that thou mayest bring the causes unto god i will give thee counsel let me give you from experience from my own background and from my observation i've been in this place i've been i've been in life and in service more longer than you have been let me give you counsel look at verse 23 now in verse 23 if thou shalt do this and god command thee so i don't want to come between you and god and god command this so anytime you give counsel anytime you advise people you must make them go back to the prevailing declaration of the word of God. If God command thee so, then shall thou be able to endure. And all these people shall also go to their place in peace. In Psalm 33, verse 11. Psalm 33, we're reading from verse 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever go back to the word of god whatever you hear from people whatever you read in books whatever theologians say whatever people who say they have no original language and they know this and they know that maybe they do but then understand they are not god and because they are not god whatever advice whatever opinion and whatever teaching they relate to you the counsel of the lord standeth forever the thoughts of his heart to all generations all generations and in all those generations there may be times of distress 
and times of peculiarity and times of pandemic but whatever the generation is the counsel of the lord standeth forever proverbs chapter 19 verse 21 in proverbs chapter 19 reading from verse 21 there are many devices in a man's heart and those devices and those opinions will come out of their opinion will come out of their mouth will come out in their counseling nevertheless the counsel of the lord that shall stand always refer back to the word of god whenever people counsel you there may be people that will sympathize with your situation you are suffering in that marriage and uh, the husband or the wife is not doing the right thing is cheating you she has cheated you is unfaithful she is unfaithful and i feel your pain and i feel all the distress you are going through and i empathize with you and in empathy and sympathy i counsel you go do this whatever they say maybe they mean well but you will still go back to the counsel of the lord which shall stand forever we're coming to number three number three the appreciated concentration on our preferred destiny now paul the apostle is going to bring us to the very purpose of life and the pivot of life and the pursuit of life it tells us in first corinthians chapter 7 verse 29 it says but this i say brethren the time is short it says you understand the lord will come soon the age of the world is near and because of that don't get pinched down don't get bogged down with difficulties in the families challenges in the family and all these uh, attacks and affliction coming to us because of marriage it says it will not be long and we must remember that eternity is forever and ever we must remember that heaven when we get there the first five minutes to get there you'll forget all the tears you'll forget all the pain you'll forget all the pressure and you'll forget every bad thing you have gone through you'll forget all the persecution the time is short we'll soon be getting home we'll soon be getting to our eternal home because the time is short it, rem it remained but the both day that have wives be as do the arch none they that have difficult wives as do the arch none no difficulty they that have challenging challenging marriages as do the arch no challenge and the marriage at all and those that have persecution the wife is persecuting you the husband is persecuting you as though they are none concentrate on your preferred destiny concentrate on heaven don't let your life be turned around only by that difficulty and that challenge you understand when you have a pole and then you have a short rope and you tie an animal to that rope and to the pole the animal will be revolving and going around that pole it cannot go beyond the length of the rope that ties him that ties that animal to the pole and our lives as human beings are like that when you have a challenge when you have difficulty and when you have a bone a pain in the neck all the time you're looking at that difficulty it's like you're tied to the pole of that suffering and the pull of that persecution and your life is revolving around that if you want to go out i cannot go out because look at what i'm going through if you want to move forward and be visionary and do something for the kingdom of god i cannot do that look at what i'm going through your decisions will be moderated 
and your decision will be limited by that pole and the rope that ties you to that pole but it says be as though there's no challenge be as though there's no persecution be as though there is no difficulty that's why it says let those who are married you have wives as if you arch none look at verse 30 in verse 30 it says and they that weep as though they wept not the things causing the weeping can you laugh when that thing is there when you're always looking at that it changes your personality if you are a go-getting person if you are a person that is always happy always joyful always excited and if you are a person that you know is uh, friendly and loving if you have something that makes you weep and you're looking at that thing making you weep every time and you concentrate on that pain on that persecution you concentrate on that difficulty and harassment in the family and you're weeping all the time your personality is changed you cannot smile anymore you cannot be excited anymore you cannot be friendly anymore and you cannot be loving anymore it says forget about that and they that weep as though they wept not and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not you have the things of this world that makes you rejoice and then it has the tendency of making you forget heaven and make you forget that this is not a permanent home and therefore it says as though they rejoice not and they that buy you have good bargain you're buying land you're buying houses and you're buying property you're buying whatever it says as though they possess not look at verse 31 in verse 31 and they that choose this world as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passes away in short, is seen, concentrate on the things that we need to have in the preferred destiny. Let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 10, reading from verse 37. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You have a good family. The father is so nice, the mother is so nice, and your mind concentrates on the father, on the mother, and you are so glued and attached to the father and the mother, and you forget evangelism, and you forget consecration, and you forget sowing and reaping, and you forget your consecration to the Lord, commitment to the Lord. It says, he that loveth father or mother, more than me is not worthy of me and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me there should be no relationship on earth that takes our mind away from the love we ought to have for the lord look at john gospel according to saint john chapter 21 verse 15 john chapter 21 but 15 so when they are dying jesus said to simon peter simon son of jonas lovest thou me more than these that's the question the lord is always asking you have a good marriage but you still love christ more than wife love christ more than husband you've got children nice children wonderful children lovest thou me more than the children you've got friends of god family extended family and it's a nice family always asking about you and when you want to go for evangelism that's one uh, that's the time the lovely family member will come and he just want to sit down and share are you going to abandon evangelism lovest thou me more than this you've got a good job and the, the people they're praising you they're appreciating you because of your contribution to that place of work 
with all the same are you going to replace the love for christ and the love for the things of god with that work lovest thou me more than these and he says unto him yea lord yes lord thou knowest that i love thee he says unto him feed my lambs we're coming to point number two now point number two the single-minded consecration without perplexing distractions without perplexing distractions there are things that may come into our lives and they serve as distractions when you were first born again, you wake up in the morning and you read your Bible to satisfaction and you prayed your heart out. It was like you are in a retreat, a personal retreat. But now something has come. Maybe a job, something has come. Maybe a wife, something has come. Maybe a husband something has come children something has come you have to pay school fees for the children here at home and also overseas you have to take this job and this job and make ends meet distraction that takes you away from your bible reading that takes you away from your devotion unto the lord now when you were first born again you were a giver you pay your tithes and offering and you, you also give for the things progress of the assembly and of the church and then if there are people that are in need you give and give and give without looking back but now there's a family and now yes you have to take care of your family and you have to make sure that your wife is not suffering your husband is not suffering but it can come to a head to the point that the need of the family and the spending for your wife and the spending for your husband and for your own extended family and for her own extended family is digging deep into your commitment unto the Lord. That's distraction it becomes perplexing and you wonder why can't i run the way i used to run pray the way i used to pray and give the way i used to give evangelize the way i used to evangelize associate fellowship with the people of god and the children of god as i used to associate as i used to fellowship those that are distractions that bring you into perplexity and paul the apostle is saying i want you to so reorganize your spiritual life and to so reorganize your marital life and to so reorganize your commitment to the lord that you have single-minded consecration without perplexing distractions three things number one our single-minded devotion pleasing god without disaffection pleasing god without disaffection without lessening our love our affection our commitment our consecration to the lord number two our spousal duty duty to our spouse duty to the husband duty to the wife practical godliness without division without a divided heart without being torn here and there where do i go do i go to the side of my wife or go to the side of god without a divided heart do i still keep my commitment my consecration that i made before marriage can I still continue with that consecration and that devotion and that dedication while inside the marriage? You don't have a divided heart. Any time, any day, whatever you're looking at, God still takes number one position. And yet you have your duty to your spouse and your duty to the family number three the steadfast dedication and preaching the gospel without distraction let's come to number one number one is our single-minded devotion 
pleasing God without disaffection. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. In verse 32, but I will have you without carefulness. No worry, no anxiety, no divided heart, no misplaced, uh, misplaced priority. He that is unmarried, careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. How do I please the Lord with my time? Think about that. How do I please the Lord with my skill? with my energy, with my strength, with my education, with everything I've learned, with my experience, you care and you concentrate on pleasing the Lord. And look at Romans chapter 15, verse 3. Romans chapter 15, verse 3. For even Christ pleased not himself a Savior, a Lord, a perfect example for even Christ, please not himself. And what are you to do as a believer, as a child of God? You follow Christ, and when there is any alternative, do I go this side and please the Lord, or do I go that side and please myself and please my wife? Your wife will not take the place of God or the place of getting to heaven. Christ please not himself. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 4. In Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 4, it says, No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life. No man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Join this society, join that assembly, join that corporation, join this and join that, and it attaches you more and more to the affairs of this life. If you are going to please the Lord with your heart, with your love, with your devotion as you are praising the Lord before this time that you are promoted in life as you are praising the Lord before this time that you are now married no man whether married or not married that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier Always think about that. The Lord has chosen you, and therefore you want to please Him all the time. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, as God entrusted anything into your hand the gospel into your hand the ministry into your hand a peculiar service into your hand so winning winning your community unto the lord he has spoken to you he has taught you you have prayed you have consecrated you have vowed and the gospel is put in your trust the salvation of men the salvation of people entrusted into your hand as you are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so speak we not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. But God, we please God who tries our hearts. Look at number two there. Number two, our spousal duty. Practical godliness without division. We have a role to play in our families. And we have, you have a wife, you have to feed her. And therefore you have to look for job. Therefore you have to earn income. 
and through that income you have to take care of the wife and when children come into the family that necessitates your providing not only for the wife but for the children and when those children reach school age you want to put them in good schools and when they go beyond the secondary and they need to get to a higher institution you have to make sure that by prayer and by dedication to your physical engagement you have enough to provide for the wife for the children for the education and for their upbringing and training that's why we still have a duty in the family and yet that duty is practical practical godliness but without a divided heart look at first corinthians chapter 7 verse 33 but he that is married cares for the things of the world is not talking about godliness care it for the things of the world market care it for the things of the world office care it for the things of the world you have to go to the company to work care it for the things of the world farming care it for the things of the world fishing care it for the things of the world selling and buying all those things do not take place in heaven fishing farming buying selling textile industry ordering for something getting goods at the wharf distributing salesmanship all those things are of the world yet they contribute to our earning income that will help us in taking care of the family that's why it says he that is married cared for the things that are of the world you have to build shelter you have to provide accommodation provide clothing how he may please the wife how he may make the wife happy settled when she eats well when she's well clothed when she has security when she has accommodation and when she has happiness and joy in the home that is pleasing to the wife and that's her duty as a husband and the wife too making sure that she pleases the husband you are enterprising and both of you you are joining hands together and you are moving the family the children forward in verse 34 in verse 34 there is a difference also between a wife and a virgin the married woman careth for the things of the Lord that she may be holy in body and in spirit the married woman the virgin careth only for the things of the Lord and she keeps herself as uh, you know a woman that is healthy that is smart but when you are married and then you have children your physique will change a little your outlook will change a little because he she that is married careth for the things of the world she runs up and down she has to go to market she has to go to the grocery buy all the stuff that she needs to cook and then go to the kitchen at the appropriate time she cannot say I'm tired now I will do that when I'm well rested the family is waiting and they need to eat at the appropriate time and the husband asks the time he will go out to the place of work and she has to do everything to make sure that the husband is ready and she's taking care of the husband physically and psychologically and she's a homekeeper therefore she's caring for the things we do in the world all that we don't do in heaven that's why it says there are things of the world 
uh, you are not going to be cooking in heaven you are not going to be washing your husband's clothes and washing the children's clothes in heaven we'll do that in the world you are not going to be going to the market in heaven we'll do that in the world in the world because you are married you have to do all those things how she may please her husband to make the husband a fulfilled man a happy man a contented man a man of the home a man that goes out and wants to come back because there is no place on earth like home that's what he's talking about he tells us in first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 in first timothy chapter 5 reading from verse 8 it tells us but if any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own household in providing for those of our own household of our own house those are things of the world they don't do that in heaven the, those who get to heaven they're like the angels in heaven no buying and selling and you know nothing like taking care of these material things but while we're here those who do not provide for their own house they have denied the faith and it's worse than an infidel you'll not be an infidel in jesus name look at number three number three our steadfast dedication preaching the gospel without distraction preaching the gospel without distraction you know sometimes uh, maybe you've experienced this in a dream you are standing and you want to go forward all of a sudden you find there is something tying your leg and so while you're trying to move forward that thing is pulling you back or maybe you have had a dream you're trying to climb a ladder and while you're trying to climb there's something pulling you downward or maybe you want to open there's a door that is open you want to enter in and it's like there's something that is pushing you back those are distractions when in life you want to get up but there's distraction that is pulling you down you know where to go you know where to what to do but there is something unseen there's something maybe in your spirit there is something sadness or gloom or happiness around or circumstances that will not allow you to get to the height spiritually you ought to get to those are distractions and the apostle is saying look at your life on the inside look at your life in the family and look at your life spiritually and look at where you could have been the years you have given you have given your heart to the lord 10 years now 15 years now or 20 years now and your goal at the beginning of the race if you had been able to follow that that vision that goal that ideal that consecration that ambition that aspiration if there was nothing disturbing you if there's nothing dragging you back if there was nothing retarding your progress you would have got to a higher place in the lord it says now gather yourself together think about it in this new year and look at the things that have been distracting you and one by one present them unto the lord that by the grace of god you will move faster this year in jesus name you will reach where god appoints that you will reach in jesus name there must be steadfast dedication preaching the word preaching the gospel without distraction look at first corinthians chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 35 first corinthians chapter 7 verse 35 and this i say for your profit for your spiritual profit this i say for your profit for your progress this i say for your profit for your upliftment in the things of the lord that i may cast i that not that i may cast a snare upon you 
but that which is comely, which is proper, which is right, that she may attend upon the Lord without distraction, that she may attend upon the service of the Lord without distraction, that she may concentrate on the calling of the Lord without distraction that she may fulfill your vow and fulfill your consecration to the Lord from the time you are born again until this time that you will do that without distraction now distraction sometimes can be seen can be tangible at other times distractions are not tangible are not visible and you cannot see them and those distractions sometimes they start in little ways little ways little ways until you cannot escape and that distraction sometimes may totally kill your enthusiasm kill your zeal and kill your excitement in serving the lord i said there may be things visible or something invisible there was an experiment that was performed there was a baby elephant born and that baby elephant when it was born they used chain a strong chain to bind to tie the leg to a pole and as that baby elephant was getting older and older and try to walk and try to break loose and try to move because she's seen other elephants and the way they carry themselves and the things they do he wanted to but he could not because of the chain after trying over and over and over and he could not break the chain then he got settled that's how distraction works and then eventually those people carefully took up the chain and then they replaced the chain with a little thread that now the elephant was strong enough mighty enough to break loose and then and, and move very fast but she's now preconditions and conditioned to that chain that little rope that was nothing then tied him there in our lives something is like that as something has happened has happened has happened that conditioned you and slowed you down that conditioned you and stopped you that conditioned you and distracted you that conditioned you and you always look that direction eventually all those things are removed they're no more there but habitually now you're still slow your sluggish is the result of the distractions of the past habitually now you're standing still you cannot move you cannot pray and you cannot make a kind of a great move and follow on in the lord and your consecration has become at a zero level because of that condition you need to go to the Lord in prayer and examine yourself and say, Lord, why am I like this? Why am I like blind? Why am I like my spiritual sight is dim? Why is there no excitement, no passion, and no zeal? Something has conditioned me to be like this. I wasn't like that before. And as you discover, then you pray and tell the Lord, take all these distractions that tie me down, that will not allow me to move the direction and with the speed I ought to move. The Lord will answer your prayer. And you will do great things for the glory of God, yet beyond all those distractions in Jesus' name. I will preach the gospel. I said I will preach the gospel without distraction. The Lord confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, the selfless confirmation 
of his perfect doctrine let's come to chapter 7 we're looking at three things here. number one proper comprehension avoiding corrupting misinterpretation number two parental consent in their children's marriage number three perpetual command from his changeless message number one proper comprehension avoiding corrupting misinterpretation let's look at chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 36 chapter 7 verse 36 but if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely towards his virgin if she pass the flower of her age and need so be need so require let him do what he will he sinneth not let them marry verse 37 nevertheless he that standeth steadfast in his heart having no necessity but has power over his own will and has so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well there are people that misunderstand those two verses of scripture they think and they interpret it to mean that here is a single man wanting to get married to a lady and then whatever she wants to do or he wants to do let him go ahead and let him do whatever he wants to do with that virgin lady but that's not the interpretation i pray god will give us proper understanding of his word in jesus name let's look at luke chapter 11 luke chapter 11 we're reading from verse 52 luke 11 verse 52 woe unto you lawyers for ye have taken away the key of knowledge ye entered not in yourselves and them that were entering in ye hindered that's what corrupting misinterpretation of the word of god does somebody takes the key the key of knowledge the key of revelation the key of divine wisdom and the key of proper application of the word of god he does not enter in to he threw the door of obedience and he himself is not entering in in second corinthians chapter 2 reading from verse 17 second corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 for we are not as many which corrupt the word of god there are people that have some preconceived ideas and they have the pressure and the temptation in their flesh and they come to those verses we have read in chapter 7 verses 36 and 37 and because of the corruption of their nature and because of the temptation in their flesh they are attracted to committing sin immorality because of that they corrupt the word of God. But Paul the Apostle says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Chapter 4, verse 2. In chapter 4, verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty when you come to the word of god you forget your own situation your own peculiarity your own trial your own pressure your own persecution 
and you keep the word of God as the word of God. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking crafting in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. In Luke chapter 24, verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. We need that all the time. When we come to the passages of the word of God, especially passages that have confused many people, we need to pray that Christ, that the Lord, that the Spirit of God, the author of the scriptures, who gave us the scriptures by the inspiration of the Spirit, that he will open our understanding that we might understand the scriptures. Point number two, what do those verses mean? Look at First Corinthians again, chapter 7, from verse 36, and we'll read through to verse 38. And as we talk about the man, we're talking about the father and the daughter. Look at this now. But if any man, a father, seeing that he, the father, behaveth himself uncomely towards his virgin daughter, if she, the virgin daughter, pass the flower of her age, has come to the age of poverty and maturity, and needs so require, she said, Daddy, I need to get married. Let him, the father, do what he will, release the virgin daughter. He sinneth not, let your daughter and the fiancé marry, let them marry. Verse 37. In verse 37, nevertheless, he, the father, that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, the daughter is not putting pressure, and the daughter is saying, I'm not in a hurry. I want to uh, graduate. I want to have master's degree. I want to do doctorate. I want to be settled in a profession before I get married. And so there's no hurry. There's no necessity, but has power over his own will. And then that's the man, that's the father. All the people putting pressure. I but when your, your daughter, when she goes to get married ask your daughter uh, are there no suitors coming is there no this is there no that and this father has real will has understanding has determination i want my daughter to finish this and be well placed before i release her in marriage and has so decreed in his heart that he the father will keep his daughter the virgin he do it well verse 38 in verse 38 so then he the father that gives her a marriage do it well it's talking about the father but he the father that giveth her not in marriage, wanting the daughter to finish and with the profession before getting married, he doeth better. That's what he's saying. Look at Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 to 7. Is the father that cared for the marriage of Isaac, the son, uh, before uh, wanting a wife for that, uh, for that son, uh, and he do it well. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we're looking at verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 7, looking at verse 3, neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter, thou shalt not give unto his son. It's the responsibility of the father either to give or not to give. Nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. 
I pray God will give us total, complete understanding in all things in Jesus' name. Did I hear your amen? amen. Number three now. Number three, parental, a perpetual command from his changeless message. Perpetual command from his changeless message. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 39. First Corinthians chapter 7 verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. The wife is bound by the law of God as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. That's the word of God. And that word is settled forever in heaven. It will be settled forever in your heart as well in Jesus' name. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89, forever. O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Can we all read that together? One, two, three, go. Let's read that again with excitement. Let's read that with a commitment to obey the total word of God. And as we obey that which is settled forever in heaven, the blessings of God, the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the provision of God will be settled in every one of your lives and families in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. The word of God is settled and we have heard that word of God and God wants to have that word obeyed and that word he wants in our life totally settled and the blessings of God will abide and remain upon every life. Please open your mouth and pray to the Lord. He'll give you the grace to be obedient to every part of the word in Jesus' name.